If you believe X, Y, and Z, are you then either explicitly or implicitly committed to believing in A, B, and C? And if you do believe them, do you believe there is an inter interrelationship that rigidly binds these six positions? And if this is so, are you an ideologist? Do you believe in a system of political thought that tends to comprehend all important social questions, giving the answers to all important social problems? It is commonly conceded that the word ideology began seriously with Karl Marx, who promulgated a political cosmology. But there are many other ideologues, feminists, racists, even anti-racists, perhaps even libertarians. The purpose of this hour is to explore the theory and uses of ideology, asking specifically whether there is such a thing as an ideology of conservatism. To which end we have invited Mr. Kenneth Minog, whose latest book is called Alien Powers, The Pure Theory of Ideology. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Minog is a very famous political scientist, acclaimed especially in Great Britain, where he is Professor of Political Science at the London School of Economics. Mr. Minog was born in New Zealand, went to the University of Sydney, and took advanced degrees from the London School of Economics. He has lectured widely in many countries, served as Dean of Undergraduate Studies at LSE, and is the author of The Liberal Mind, Nationalism, and the Concept of a University. Our examiner is Mr. Joseph Sobran, Senior Editor of National Review and Syndicated Columnist, about whom more in due course. I'd like to begin by asking Ms. Minog, is an ideologue or an ideologist, as you like, required to believe in an oppressor class? I cannot imagine a proper ideologist who didn't. But there uh, I run into an enormous difficulty. The word ideology is hard to pin down because it's a pompous, pretentious word. And people who simply want to talk about doctrines or ideas think it's flashier to talk about ideology. And therefore, anybody who believes in general principles is often described as an ideologue or an ideologist. Improperly. Well, how people use the word is something that you have to there's accept. There's a law of usage. Uh, you, you, you simply have to accept that. And <coughs> therefore, I have had the problem in charting ideology of trying to work out um, where the core lies. And certainly, in answering your question, I think the true ideologist undoubtedly believes in an oppressed class because the other side of ideology is always liberation. That is, one of the ways in which you can define ideology is that it is a theory of the practice of liberation. Mm -hmm. So liberation and oppression go together. Well, is the oppressing class necessarily animate? Uh, yes, it would have so to be. So the state would have to be animate then. Uh, I'm thinking of the libertarian Sp Herbert Spencer, Albert J. Nock et al., who uh, think of the and to certain extent Milton Friedman think of the state as the oppressor. But the state obviously uh, is, a, uh, is <coughs> an agent of human beings, right? So it is they who are the oppressors rather than the state uh, in, order to, uh, uh, in order to conform with your definitions? Uh, the state as an, oppress uh, as an oppressor is, of course, anarchist ideology. All anarchists believe that it's, it's government that causes violence rather than the th threat and fear of violence which causes government. Uh, it's characteristic, however, of most ideologists that they think that the oppressor class is half conscious of its oppressing status and half fooled by its own rationalizations. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you so could that's have totally governments... That's Orwellian, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, uh, not in the least. Well, well no, uh, Orwellian in the sense that uh, Big Brother was at least half convinced that he was a major benevolence in 1984, right? I rather doubt that that's what Orwell meant. I think Orwell was turning ideology itself into, into a melodrama. But I think one of the strengths of ideology is that it purports to be scientific. Mm -hmm. In purporting to be well, scientific... What are pseudo strengths? Uh, well, strengths in the sense of being persuasive. Oh, yeah, right, see, right, 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 the, right. the point of ideology is it must persuade people. It is a set of ideas designed to take people up. Mm -hmm. And it is more, most persuasive if it appears to be scientific. And in being scientific, it's generally a theory about the essential nature of the state. 
<coughs> or the essential nature of the capitalist class, yeah. or the essential nature of men in patriarchy. And that essential nature isn't necessarily connected to the thoughts that run through their heads. Indeed, the thoughts that run <coughs> through their heads uh, are frequently innocent or uh, justificatory. So it's a theory independent of what the oppressor actually thinks he's doing. Well, uh, uh, account, um, uh, as, as you do in your book, uh, but account for us the extraordinary paradox that on the one hand, uh, ideology affects to be scientifically uh, establishable. On the other hand, empirical data are at war with ideological presuppositions. The most, the most obvious example of this, I would guess, would be uh, agriculture in the Soviet Union. Uh, people know that in a free agricultural system there's usually abundance. The Soviet Union exported grain up until 1917, has had droughts every year since. Uh, now, <clears throat> given that uh, they, they simultaneously need to search out scientific truths and are bombarded by empirical uh, results that contradict those truths they seek out, how is it that they manage? Ah, now that's, that's a very complicated question. Um, in Popperian terms, of course, a scientific theory has to be refutable. It Karl has Popper. to be a set of, Karl Popper um, believes quite rightly, that a, a scientific theory has to be a set of propositions which you can go out into the world and test. Mm -hmm. You can say, is the world a bit like that? And you mm -hmm. can be proved wrong. An ideology is obviously not like that. It's a set of propositions which are very carefully insulated from testing. A priori. A priori, yes. Marx invented the notion of scientific socialism. And I think that when we talk about ideology, it's always best to take one's bearings from Marx because he's undoubtedly the genius who created this highly special form of thought. And as he came into political controversy in the 1840s, the best grip he could take upon it was to say other socialists or communists have merely been advocates of utopias of an ideal society. I am presenting with you to you a theory mm -hmm. and the theory is scientific socialism so that for most of Marx's lifetime uh, the claim was made that Marxism was scientific socialism it's made by Engels for example mm -hmm. at the graveside address but the the true logic of ideology as I've tried to argue in in alien powers is that the ideology must be a total revelation which gets behind everything mm -hmm. that modern society produces. Mm -hmm. And therefore the development of, say, Marxist ideology in the last hundred years has included criticism of science as being part of the technocratic uh, rash, instrumental rationalism of a capitalist society. So that ideology eventually has to present itself as a body of knowledge which is transparent yeah. and superior to and science, yeah. philosophy, religion, to all other ideas whatsoever. Well, <clears throat> uh, would an application of this point lead the ideologist, the Marxist, to mm. say, um, I can account for the productivity of free agriculture here in uh, exactly equivalent geographical circumstances and the lack of productivity here by using a scientific knowledge that transcends the knowledge on which uh, these empirical data are otherwise received. Mm. If so how does he accomplish that? Well, obviously, I don't think he can, and you don't think he can either. It can't be done. Uh, and it's very complicated but to explain. He has explain to be persuasive. Why. He has I, to, he has I, to I, be I know it can't be done in the sense that you and I would rule that, that he had come through with it objectively defensible performance. I'll how, tell does, you, how does he attempt I'll to tell do you it? what he would do. What he would say is that the essence of capitalism is that it is a crazy, out-of-control, productive system mm -hmm. which is always producing, it's spilling vast numbers of surpluses onto the market mm -hmm. and dominating the minds of people so that they acquire false needs, so that they'll gobble them up. But if you look at American agriculture, currently it's overproducing. The common market is overproducing in agriculture. Now, there may indeed be certain technical problems about socialist agriculture because we are in the midst of building a socialist society and perhaps human beings uh, in, in, in so under socialism have not yet acquired that sense of communal loyalty which allows us to produce 
food adequate to the needs of the people. Perhaps not quite, but we are at least building a rational system, mm -hmm. whereas this is merely part of the wi weird irrationality of capitalism. I think that's, that would be a proper ideological reply see, yeah, to that yeah, kind of yeah, objection. Yeah. And, and suppose, uh, suppose uh, I were the adversary in this um, exchange, mm. and I were to say, well, <clears throat> the <clears throat> difficulties the common market has and the difficulty is that the American agricultural market have are directly traceable to interventions by the state uh, and therefore aren't really uh, uh, authentic uh, evidences of um, capitalist uh, ah. machinations. You, you would think you would have scored a point. N my ideology would, chance, would huh? not, not, a, not a chance. <laughs> because what you, what you would not have realized is that the state itself is, as Marx said in the manifesto, the executive committee of the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm, yeah, Therefore, right. the way in which the state mo the state in the current condition of capitalism mm -hmm. is responding to the needs of different producer interests within it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is why it is intervening, and that is, it's, the state is itself part of the irrationality of capitalist right, production. Right, right. Well, uh, is, it, um, is it required of every ideology that um, it, it be redemptive, that it, it have um, an eschatological purpose, i.e., if we all become Marxists, then all kinds of beautiful things happen, right? Yes. Now, therefore, the enemy of that kind of thought would be liberalism in the antique sense of the word, right? Why? Well, the big divide is between um, people who believe in the practical world as it is mm -hmm. and the human nature we must accommodate to and who accept the political tradition of the West and what you call redemptive doctrines. These are doctrines of liberation mm -hmm. and these are beliefs that the world we live in is, is the most cunningly disguised form of oppression and domination the world has ever seen, that the business of life is to become conscious of it, which is adopting whatever ideological theory is to be recommended, and in that way to fight for liberation. And I think the key word here is liberation. Mm -hmm. Because um, Western political thought has always been preoccupied with freedom. But it's always been concerned with the assumption that people are free. You see, um, there's a very interesting passage in Rousseau's discourse on the origins of inequality in which he pours contempt upon the whole idea of liberation. He says that it is impossible for slaves ever to liberate themselves. They will simply create another slave state. And I think this is, this is a central point in, in ideology because free peoples never never liberated themselves. That is, the British never liberated themselves. The Americans never liberated themselves. The, the premise of the American War of Independence was not that the Americans were an oppressed people rising up to be free. They were already free, but they wanted a different set of political arrangements. They wanted to govern themselves. The British, again, never struggled for freedom. They were never slaves in any way. They acquired the habit mm -hmm. of free living over a long period of time so that the, the, the idea of liberation is almost the opposite of the idea of freedom. And I well, let, let me explore that a, a little uh, for a moment. The, uh, the indictment mm. uh, phrase in those opening uh, uh, sentences of the Declaration of Independence uh, directed a finger at King George mm -hmm. and said that uh, he was oppressing the people of the colonies, right? Yes, by taxing them. Oh, by doing Without a lot of things. Their... He listed 14, 13 or 14 That's things uh, of which he was guilty. Mm. Now, why would that not be accusing him of oppressing them? Uh, well, it's not oppressing them in the same sense that an ideologist means. That is, this is a claim about injustice. Yeah. That the governing of the colonies, it was claimed, was unjustly being done. That, the, that there were a series of grievances they yeah. had. This was in no way the suggestion that we have, hith we have hitherto been enslaved and um, we are now rising up to claim um, a, a freedom which will be a different kind of, of, of condition altogether. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, so I see. So in other words, they didn't, they didn't conceive of themselves as in that uh, state of servitude that uh, Not in the is, least. is required in the vocabulary of ideologists. James, George III they conceived of, to put it technically, as a tyrant, mm -hmm. but not as a master right, or a despot. Right, right, right. And that's a crucial thing. Again, you see the, um, the English, who from at least the early in the 18th century were regarded by Europeans as having a special vocation for liberty, 
never struggled for it or acquired it by struggle. That is, they, they um, after Anglo-Saxons and Normans uh, came together in, in England, they developed institutions like juries.